and stand and sing the Lord is in the Holy Temple as we begin our second service. pray. Our Father and God, we are thankful for this awesome privilege to be once more in your house, to praise you, to glorify your name, and to thank you for everything that you've done for us. Let your Holy Spirit fill this place today. We ask this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. In Psalms 1, 18 verse 24, David said, this is the day that the Lord has made, and I will rejoice and be glad in it. I know you are glad in this day, today, just as I am. And with this word, I welcome each and every one of you, and there must be some of us on doing this this morning via YouTube, or I don't know which other channel that we use. Uh, you are welcome as well. And to start this service, we are going to sing the words of the number 518, standing on the promises of God. testimonies every Sabbath evening um, 
doing family prayer time just to welcome the Sabbath. And I ask God to forgive me because I'm always hard on my family to come up with something. Because I know there must be something. Might be shy, we might not want to share, but there is something. Because one author says, um, no man is safe one hour without prayer. Because she knows in one hour a lot can happen. A lot can happen. And God protects us every single minute, second in our lives. So the floor is open for you to share your testimonies with us. Whatever God has done for you throughout this week, small or big, Testimonies everywhere. Anyone else? Has God been good to someone throughout this week? Brother Glenn? As the gas up again, I've been just doing um, doing the busy times, but been wanting to give it up, and it seems like the Lord's not letting me because I'm. This is my way of getting in contact with people. You know, people say, well, you're different. Uh, why? And, and then they, they, they say afterwards, I says, well, you seem like a uh, you know, guy we can talk to. Then they tell their problems in life. And so I've been getting a lot of that lately. So I've had to uh, not think about the money, but yet think about the people I go in contact with. Amen. Amen. Glenn just had a birthday yesterday. Amen. <laughs> Anyone else? Simeon is next. Pete? Happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath. Yes, uh, this is like a, a Thanksgiving. Uh, I was looking for a group in campus. I'm, I'm in school. So uh, I've been tr trying to reach people I knew who are Adventists. They were not committing. I came to find out that Christian Union School, uh, they do regular Bible study. I was interested. So most of the time I was not getting an invitation to go and uh, do Bible study with them. And there is this one time they sent me an invitation and they were learning about Sabbath and they were getting convicted to, to keep Sabbath. So I was invited over, I, I shared about Sabbath, and we have been having regular Bible study with them. So continue to pray that God will touch their hearts so that they know the truth. Amen. Amen. Sim Glenn and Simeon. I forgot to mention one thing. I got a new grandson on the way in, in a couple of weeks. Uh, so it's going to be in May, so pray for everything will turn out all right. Amen. Simeon? Simeon. Pray for, for two of my workers that have, have been hospitalized and just last week. Um, one, one got uh, malaria. Um, yeah, he came. Uh, he came from the extreme north um, to our place, and uh, I mean, he, he didn't use the, the net, mosquito net, and well, he couldn't escape for that. Um, praise God, is out of uh, of the hospital, 
and also the little boy that was standing is uh, um, he has he was hospitalized also um, anemia, how it, anemia 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 so he passed also three three days at the hospital praise God they got outside uh, two days ago um, so I would like you to pray for them the one who had malaria went uh, back to the village um, I have a model that that do the the back and forth to the to the town when they have an emergency so he came back just uh, yesterday to to buy food and bring to the village but he's new to this area he knows how to drive model but he he's not using to drive the model on the sand because we have to go on the beach and uh, the the sea was coming already up so it wasn't down anymore and then some people with experience that forced so they know how to avoid the and he wanted to try that and uh, unfortunately he was uh, in sandwich in between the wi the, the waves and and the, the trees so it, you know the power of the waves it took him all and the model you know all in the water praise god he was in front of a hotel and uh, there were some soldiers also that was inside they came to rescue him. Praise God is safe. Um, he wasn't hurt. So I would like to, to thank God for that and uh, pray also for those who are recovering. What are the two names, Simeon? Um, is uh, Jean mm -hmm. and little Matthias. Yes. Okay. And I will invite you to have your little notebook and write the names down and experience together the power of prayer, it's not just today where we're going to pray but throughout the week so we can have more testimonies. Good morning, church. Um, i like to pray for uh, my family because um, my sister, husband, I mean, my sister's sister, son, he died last week of COVID in Trinidad. And um, about 10 years ago, his brother died from drowning. So... He was about 43. The, he, the guy who died, he's 51, so he's pretty young. And um, the sad thing about it is they belong to a different denomination. They are Hindu, and my sister-in-law is Adventist, and she, it breaks her heart to think that they, this person died without you know, having the opportunity or have, have that that opportunity to, to come to the Lord because he was in a coma for a short period of time but he died and it just touched base with us that how life is so important that we don't know when God wh when death can come upon us so don't wait for tomorrow to give your heart to the Lord you know make sure you do it today because it's important we don't know if tomorrow will come so I want to continue to pray for the young people. Please keep um, the, the funeral services this morning at 11, at, from 8 to 11. So it's over right now. But still keep them in prayer, in comfort, in this time of comfort. Thank you. Amen. While you're working towards Pete, I, I want to uh, thank God quickly for protecting my family down in Haiti. Um, since I left Haiti to be here in the United States like 16 years ago and nothing has gotten better it's it's um, worse 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 and and uh, has been a lot from um, you know killing people on the street kidnappings and things like that but I always pray for my family and I haven't been deceived by God he always protect my brothers my sisters and my acquaintance relatives down there I thank him for that because Tomorrow is never guaranteed down there. You just, for that one day that you have, that moment that you have. And I praise him for that. Pete, one and two. I had a chance to visit a friend yesterday. We go back to kindergarten in Norwood. And we have we, kindergarten, he had um, eight years of St. Catherine's School, and four years as a Varian brother. So he's a friend for a long, long time. So I visited him yesterday, and uh, it's kind of like you pick up where you left off. We've been off and on through the years, you know, marriage and all the other things. 
But um, <laughs> I think he's a, he's a tough nut to crack. But I just, God just put him in my heart. And I know next week he's having an operation for his prostate. And I pray for him for that. And also we'll get back together again after next, after next week. And uh, we can just talk and um, we can get back together and, and work the lot in there. Cause I know he needs that very much. And what's his name? Uh, Richie. Richie. Okay. Any other praise, prayer requests, Francois? Cedarbrook, our former pastor, our new pastor, and all the people who work hard for God here. Amen. Amen. Anyone else? All right. Any silent request this morning? Amen. So we are going to pray. I will have to be on my feet, but if you can be on your knees, you are welcome to do so. Precious Father and God, we get to a point where we understand that words are not enough to express our gratitude to you for what you are doing, what you have been doing in our lives, in spite of us, in spite of our sins, our reluctance to be obedient to you, you insist of being with us and guiding and guiding us every day. We I thank you, oh Lord. We want to praise your name for that. And not only you protect us, you guide us, you guard us, but you provide for us every day of what we need to sustain the life that you gave us. We thank you for church family, being together to worship you. We thank you for this awesome experience, and we ask that, oh Lord, you may find pleasure in our worship this morning. As we pray, we want to Remember Glenn's grandson, a new grandson to come. We ask, O oh Lord, that um, the, the mother may have a, a safe delivery and that your name be glorified throughout the process. We want to pray for um, our friends in Cameroon, Jean and Little Mathias, um, being sick. You said in your word you forgive all sins and you heal all diseases in the Psalms of David and we believe, O oh Lord, that you are the healer. You are the one who can heal your children. And we recommend these two brothers to you and we ask, O oh Lord, that you may do something marvelous for them. We also want to remember Cherry Ann's family. Um, Experiencing a loss in this moment, we ask, O Lord, that you may give them the strength that they need to go through this situation and that uh, they may realize the, not only the value of life, but the fragility of life. And also, all the young people in our church, they are in your hands today, especially those who will be traveling Thursday uh, to Puerto Rico. Uh, we ask your blessings upon them and we ask the Lord that everything goes well and that they may find a reason to um, trust you more and to obey you more. Um, say that book is in your hand this morning. Um, all the students, the staff, uh, from the principal to the teachers, everybody, they are all in your hands and we ask the Lord that you may bless this ministry that those students may never forget the worship time, the prayer time, or the learning experience that they are having in this school. We recommend our entire church to you. 
and our brother Alfred who is going to share the word of life with us this morning. We ask the Lord that your Holy Spirit indwell him and that he may speak directly uh, from you and that your word may reach out to our hearts this morning. Please listen to our prayers, dear Lord. Be with us as we ask. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. worship in, in giving. I will ask the deacons to be ready. And I'll read 2 Corinthians 9 verse 10. Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. With this word, the deacons will walk to, throughout the pews and collect what you have bought today. Let us pray. We want to thank you, Lord, for um, the possibility to bring something to your house today. Thank you for jobs and any other opportunities that you gave us. By any means, we are able to have an income. We want to thank you and we ask that, Lord, whatever we have collected this morning may contribute to the advancements of your cause. And we pray this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Now it's Children's Corner. And when I say children's corner, I just think of Cindy automatically <laughs> in my head. But don't put your wallet away. Uh, the kids will be running around. And pl p please put something in this little, little bucket, because they're not going to go away. Get something ready. <laughs>
Good morning, little children, and happy Sabbath. You know, today I'm going to do the children's story. And today's children's story is about a boy named Merrick in a brown paper bag. Did you guys see what I have in a brown paper bag? Right? This story is somewhat a true story. You see, in Trinidad, where I grew up, in a small village, everyone knew each other. And just across the road from where my home was, we had a, a dear neighbor who had three boys. And their names were Merrick, Marlin, and Mervyn. Their mother's name was Mary, and their father's name was Michael. We call them the M family because everyone in this family name started with the letter M, right? The story is about Merrick in particular. He was the youngest of his three brothers. His family loves to go to church on Sabbath morning. Don't you guys love to come to church on Sabbath morning with your mommy and daddy? Hey, Merrick was just about five years old, and he loved listening to the children's story. The pastor stood up and began to give a children's story about how important it is for us to give. Merrick listened very carefully to what the pastor was saying. That it is so much better to give than to receive, he said. Plant a seed and God will multiply your blessings. Merrick saw when it was time to give an offering, people were taking out money and putting it into the offering tray. People were so happy to give, but on this Sabbath, Merrick did, ha did not have no money. This bothered him all week long, and he came up with an idea that next Sabbath, he took came up with an idea the next Sabbath when they asked for an offering he's going to give as much as he can. Merrick did not have no money but this time he knew what he was going to do. The next Sabbath came he was the first one to get up and he was so excited to go to church. It was no surprise that on Sabbath, he took with him a brown paper bag, for he often took a snack with him to church in case he gets hungry. Some of us like to do that. The time for offering came, and Merrick took the brown paper bag and placed it in the offering plate without anyone noticing. The family returned home from church as the Sabbath ended, the family were all sitting at the table eating supper, and the phone rang. It was the pastor calling. His mother answered the phone, and she was surprised that the pastor was calling. And also, their conversation was very short, which raised the curiosity of the whole family. Mary, come here, she exclaimed. Mark turned to his mother with his head bended and his little face fixed to the floor. She took him from the table to the upstairs bedroom. And with a soft voice, she asked Mary, what did you do? Kids, what did you think Merrick did? Can anyone guess what Merrick did? What did Merrick do? Um, I think messed up the whole table. He messed up the whole table. <laughs> what did you think he did? He gave his snack. He gave his snack. What did you think he did? Uh, uh. Uh, that's good. <laughs> Anybody else? What did you think he did? What did you think he had in that brown paper bag? Did you think he had a snack? Well, let's find out. My, well, my dearest little one, Merrick was so convinced about giving. What did you think he had in that brown paper bag again? 
I'm going to give you a second guess. Food? You think so? What do you think? Maybe she gave her a lot of facts and then she would have her mind was alone. Oh, okay. All right. Merrick saw when his mother was, okay. You see kids, long ago, people would keep money or savings in their homes. Merrick, was the, where, Merrick saw where his mom always put their savings in a special room, a special place in her room. Merrick thought that he was doing a good thing by taking the family's money and put it in, into the brown paper bag. And he gave it to the church as an offering. His mom was that angry, but she was so moved by the impression the children's story had on Merrick. She explained to him it was not right for him to take the money, that if he needed to give an offering, he should ask his mommy and his daddy, okay? Eventually, the pastor knew what the money, who the money, the money belonged to and gave his parents back their savings. How many of us like to give? The Bible teaches us it is better for us to give than to receive. My friend Merrick is still a given person today. We don't see much of each other. But when we do see each other, it's always a reminder how innocent children can be when it comes to the word of God. Right, guys? So I have a brown paper bag. Can you guess what it has in it? Money. Yay. So I, I hope I have enough. But I would like everyone to take a quarter. And if you like, you can put it in a bucket or you can keep it. It's up to you, but make sure you don't put it in your mouth. Acts 20, 
chapter 35, Acts 20, 35 says, In all things I have shown you that by working hard in this way we must keep the weak and remember the words of our Lord Jesus Christ. How he himself said, It is more blessed to give than to receive. All right, guys, we're going to pray now, okay? Pray. Let us pray. Close our eyes, bend our heads. Dear Jesus, what a privilege it is to receive your gift of eternal salvation. Help us to teach our children to be like you. The most rewarding gift any parents can receive is reaping the reward of having children growing up with the love of God in their hearts. As Jesus has given all for us, help us to love others as Jesus loved us. Thank you, Lord, for the privilege of giving. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. Thank you for the children's story. Thank you, Sherry Ann, for this um, beautiful giving experience. It's a giving exercise that they just had. It reminded me of Masia Simeon. Masias will not give it back. <laughs> uh, our scripture reading this morning is found in Matthew 24, verse 8 to 10. And I will read. All these are the beginning of sorrows. Then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted and shall kill you. And you shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. Verse 10, and then shall many be offended, and shall betray one another, and shall hate one another. May the Lord add his blessing on the reading of his word. Um, as I said before, the family of God is big. We have brothers and sisters we, don't, we haven't met before. This morning we have one of our brothers, um, Tom. He's the one who's going to share the word of God with us this morning, and I will ask you to pray that we may receive a blessing this morning. Okay. Ah, we have a special music before, Fred. Be attentive. can sing along if you know the words. I live a world 
weeks ago we spoke about the ultimate goal as the Lord talks about the ultimate goal he gave you eight verses that bring it home hard and heavy and that is to overcome sin in the world and to be with Christ forever is there any higher goal than that raise your hands if you can think of a higher goal than that that's the ultimate goal so I'd like to continue talking about how to achieve that ultimate goal, but we need to look at what's motivating us. Let's have a word of prayer. Thank you, Lord, to be able to be here on the Sabbath in a holy gathering, Lord, a holy convocation. We're here to focus on you, to learn. We need your help with the Holy Spirit to quicken our intellect and sharpen our minds, Lord. Help us to understand. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Dr. Mark. While we're waiting for the technical component, 
I want to read to you the scripture reading. How many brought your Bibles today? Raise your hands if you brought your Bible. All right, excellent. So let's go back to Matthew. If you want to understand to prepare for the end times, there are only a few areas you really have to look in scripture. Psalms 91, Matthew chapter 24 and 25, the book of Daniel, and the book of Revelation. But the Lord himself in chapter 24 of Matthew gives you the quick version, and then he assumes you're going to read the scriptures that he's inspired and learn the rest of it, right? But he gives you the outline version. <clears throat> So let's read this together, Matthew chapter 24, starting with verse 4. And Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you, for many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. And you shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you believe, be not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be famines, and pestilence, and earthquakes in diverse places. All these things are the beginning of sorrows. Then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted, and shall kill you, and you shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. The words on these pages have already gone around the world since 1844, many times over. So he says something very interesting, and look at verse 14. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then the end shall come. The words on this page have already gone around the world many times. So what gospel is he talking about? He's talking about the one where you will have to stand in the worst of times and honor him and show his character to be amazing. That gospel that lives in you is what it's all about. It's not just words on a page. They're already gone around the world many times. It's the gospel living in you. So how will you be motivated? <clears throat> Fear or faith? If fear is the symptom, what is the condition? We have clinicians in here, yes? Nurses, doctors, all sorts of medical specialists. If fear is the symptom, what is the condition? We need to diagnose that problem. Fear is one of the most greatest motivators that the world understands. Oxford Dictionary. An unpleasant emotion caused by belief that someone or something is dangerous, likely to cause pain or a threat. A feeling of anxiety concerning the outcome of something or safety and well-being of someone. A mixed feeling of dread and reverence. Feel anxiety or apprehension or fear. Oxford Dictionary. What reaction does fear cause in the human body? We need to look at that for a moment because this is what is either going to motivate you, either fear or faith is going to motivate you coming in the worst of times. So we need to understand this. An adrenaline rush, chemical reactions and neurotransmitters secreted for flight or fight mechanism. In some instances, fear caused people to run away from the cause of fear. That's away from it. In 1% of the time, it causes them to run towards what they fear to address it. Fear often represents the reason why people do what they do, otherwise known as what is their motivation. Fear is a driving force. Fear of the unknown, fear of the loss of a loved one, fear of loss of money, fear of loss of health, of a job or something. It's a driving force, would you agree? <clears throat> the most common problems associated with fear are a lack of information. 
in general. No excuse today, by the way, because we do live in a digital world. There's no excuse for lack of information. Too much of the wrong information, most people aren't willing to look at information closely because of the fear or discomfort it causes. That's the number one reason why people don't study Daniel and Revelation. They don't see the hope. But Revelation is filled with hope. I gave you all the verses, and I could have given you more on hope that Christ himself talked about in Revelation. The ultimate goal, if you overcome, here's the dream building component, you get this. That's what Jesus said. He didn't trust it to John. He had to talk about it himself. And there's a lot of fear mongering going on here. That's people that promote and sell fear. Where do you see this? In the press? the government, many transnational corporations, and in the economic markets, especially futures and commodities, they make their livelihood off fear. It's all based on fear. God never uses coercion or forceful tactics in his realm. That is a Luciferian doctrine. God does not use that. He doesn't kick open the door. He knocks. And if you invite him in, he's respectful of you and your place and your space and he said invite me in and I'll come in and not just not just be with you I'll sup with you amen <clears throat> trouble all right here we go here's a huge problem I read this to you two weeks ago this is a reason we should be very concerned Notice this, all around us are souls going down to ruin, as hopeless, as terrible as that which befell Sodom. Every day, the probation of some is closing. Every hour, some are passing beyond the reach of mercy. And where are the voices of warning and entreaty to bid this sinner flee from this fearful doom? Where are our voices to help people? Patriarchs and Prophets 140, I'll tell you, people don't write like this anymore. And what am I doing about it? What are you doing about it? And would they listen to you? Even if you had something to say, would people listen to you? The number one reason they may not listen to you is if we don't help people to deal with fear and anxiety, you may never be able to reach them and share the gospel. And with regards to this, you are your brother's keeper. Make no mistake about it, right? When Cain said that to the Lord, am I my brother's keeper? The Lord didn't answer him because the Lord asked him a question and Cain didn't answer it. The, Lord's, the rest of the Bible, the Lord answers the question, you are your brother's keeper when it comes to faith and teaching them about overcoming. Amen? So the question becomes, we need to look at and help people to see the gospel message that it makes a difference in your life and that you have peace in the storm to not be afraid and to not be angry and to not be anxious and then they might listen to what you have to say is is the gospel message making a difference in your life if you have the peace in the storm I would say yes if you don't and you look frantic I don't know that I want to listen to what you have to say Why do we need to focus on the subject of fear? Because the Bible speaks of it so often, it must be important. In fact, the Bible tells us, thou shalt not fear, right? Where have you heard that terminology, thou shalt not? I'm gonna show you. But where do you remember hearing that? About the 10 commandments, right? The commandments, the character of God documented. So notice this, Luke 21, 26, men's hearts will fail, Men's hearts falling, failing them for fear and for looking after those things which are coming on the earth. For the powers of heaven shall be shaken, Luke 21, 26. And who's talking here? It's this Christ, isn't it? Notice this. And he's talking about your mind and your wits failing you. Why? Fear can cause us to make horrible decisions and potentially cause us to betray God and other people that honor God in the last days. Christ himself told us that in Matthew 24. They're going to betray one another, and they're going to hate one another.
Let's look at the scripture reading again. Verse 8, 24, verse 8 through 10. All these things are the beginning of sorrows. Verse 9, then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted and shall kill you, and you should be hated of all nations for my name's sake. That's the gospel living in you. You're either going to have to stand for him or you won't. You're either going to operate off of fear or you're going to operate off of faith. That's it. There's no in between. Verse 10, and then shall many be offended and shall betray one another and shall hate one another. Who's talking here? This is your Lord and Savior talking, right? It's not Matthew. We need to look at scripture for answers about fear. Let's consider what Paul says in 2 Timothy 3.15. And that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation. How? Through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. Yes? Why am I looking, excuse me, asking you about this emotion? Why? Notice in 2 Corinthians, Paul gets heavy, by the way. 2 Corinthians 4, 3 to 5. Verse 3. But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost. Verse 4. In whom the God, small g, of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. Who's the God of this world? Small g. Who did Christ call the prince of this world? Your enemy, the enemy of God. So we need to overcome the world. That's what I spoke of two weeks ago. Overcome the world in sin to be with Christ forever. That's the whole goal. Verse 5, for we preach not ourselves, but we preach, we, but Christ Jesus the Lord and ourselves, your servants, for Jesus' sake. <clears throat> And let's look at some pictures. And I want to see if you can put yourself in these situations of fear. Are they going to cause fear? Would you be fearful in this situation? Let's take a look. This is Daniel in the lion's den. Notice the lions, right? Now, this is a, a drawing of this. But do you think when the king stood at the door to usher Daniel into the lion's den, do you think Daniel ran away screaming in a fearful way, or did he quietly walk forward into his prison cell? Do you think Daniel got by with a little help from his friends? Do you think Daniel trusted in the Lord? Was he quietly confident in the Lord? He had supernatural help, didn't he? Above the natural. He had help from the Lord himself. Have anybody here visited prison cells? Raise your hands if you've been in a prison cell or visited a prison cell. When you visited that prison cell, were there lions there? We could say with 100% certainty there probably weren't lions there, right? How would you feel walking into a room full of lions? Is there anything you, do you think you can overcome fear on your own? You need supernatural help, don't you? When I say supernatural, I mean above what you understand to be natural. Hence, the term supernatural. You need the Lord. Christ says, I'm the life, the truth, and the way. I'm the door, he says. There's no other way except through Christ. You're doomed unless you're aligned with Christ. You're on death row. You have no chance unless you're aligned with Christ. He's called a personal savior, is he not? What do you think that means? He's personally saving you, but only if you're aligned with him. He's the shepherd, yes? And only if you walk where the shepherd walks, and when he commands you, gives you a command, and he tells you what to do, the sheep are saved only if they listen to him, right? They know my voice, he says. They hear my voice. You want to know what present truth is? Look at what Christ is doing in the sanctuary. That's what present truth is. You hear a lot of preachers talking about this form of present truth. It's very simple. Just look to see what Christ is doing in the sanctuary. How about Jacob wrestling the Lord? But he thought he was wrestling an enemy. Right? 
he was wrestling the Lord himself, not just the angel, the angel, the perfect messenger. Why? His name change tells you who he was wrestling. You'll no longer be called Jacob, but you will be called Israel, for you have wrestled with God and been victorious. How about the martyrs? Did they show fear? This is a drawing of a man being burned at the stake. Did they show fear? In fact, many of them went to the stake singing, and thousands were converted because of their example of not having fear. Nearly 120 million killed in the 1260-year prophecy spoken of in Daniel and Revelation. That's 100,000 a year for 1260 years. Did they show fear? Paul stated, I'm sitting with Christ in heavenly places, and he wrote this when he was a prisoner in a Mamantine prison cell. I visited a Mamantine prison cell in Rome where Nero put Paul, and it's an ugly place. Now, keep in mind, you see that little hole? That little hole is the only light coming in. This is all rock. They threw a little hay down. That's where he went to the bathroom. That's where he slept. That's where the rats were all around him. And yet he says, I'm sitting with Christ in heavenly places. What was his perspective? Indeed, he was sitting with Christ in heavenly places because he was so aligned with Christ that he was able to write two-thirds of the New Testament. Amen? Folks, am I putting you to sleep today? Just raise your hand if I'm putting you to sleep. In the last days... Is, an, is a term we hear all the time. It is said that there will be only two groups in the last days. Number one, those that perfectly have the character of Christ. Number two, those that perfectly have the character of the God of this world, otherwise known as the enemy, Satan. Right? Two groups. But most people can't understand what I just said. So the Bible makes it even more simple. Since most people don't understand those two points, it makes it more clear, more rudimentary in an elementary way. The Bible says there will only be two groups at the end, either those that operate perfectly off of fear or those that operate perfectly off of faith. Amen? Can somebody say amen? Are you going to operate off of fear or off of faith? Am I? This is what we need to look at. So here... We are in a world full of turmoil. The question is, is the world falling apart around you? There's going to be storms the rest of your life. You might as well get used to it. The question is, are you going to have peace in the storm? But I've got to ask you a question. Does the size of the storm matter? Should the size of the storm matter? Right? Sickness. Loss of money. Job lost everything, did he not? Every tie to humanity he lost. Every tie, money-wise, family, wife turned against him. And yet he said, though he slay me, yet will I trust in him. He's my savior. That's, Job was fearless in that sense, wasn't he? Why? Only because he, was in the, he had the Lord in his heart. When you have the Lord in your heart, you too, right? The Bible says perfect love, what? Casts out fear. <clears throat> Does the size of the storm matter? This particular cloud spawned 15 tornadoes. It's a massive storm. I don't know if you can see it clearly here. <clears throat> And fortunately, it was just out in the plain states in the open field, so it didn't cause tremendous damage. Has anybody been up close to a tornado? There's very few things more violent on the planet than a tornado. How about this storm? I want to show you something here. This is the after. This is the before. You, you notice what that is right there? What's that look like? Hmm? A man. Do you think he'd stand there and smoke a cigarette if he knew this was coming? <clears throat> he, 
He was the last lighthouse keeper before everything went digital. French guy. Had to go out and have a smoke. But he had no idea what was coming. He had no idea that this massive wave, because he's used to sitting up top here. But he said, oh, I just go down for a smoke and see what happens. So how about these for storms? Let's talk about statistics here, because we think COVID is really bad. COVID's nothing. You're going to look back at the time of COVID and say, oh, that was a more peaceful time because a storm is coming that Jesus talks about in Matthew 24. Men's hearts will fail them. Let's look at this. The Spanish flu, 1918 to 1920. Estimated deaths in a two-year span, 50 to 100 million in two years. By the way, at the same time, World War I was going on. Polio, 1940. 100 to 1950, 27 million killed in that span. Smallpox, 1900 to 1950. This is a violent time. 1900 to 1950 was brutal. Look at this. Smallpox, 300 to 500 million deaths in a 50-year span. The Black Death, this was the king of all of them right here. Bubonic plague is the most fatal pandemic recorded in human history, causing the death of approximately 200 million people across Europe and Asia and North Africa, peaking in Europe. I mean, this is brutal. And we think COVID is bad. <clears throat> nope, gotta go back here. More storms, World War I, military and civilian casualties, approximately 40 million, ranking it among the deadliest conflicts in human history. Nine to 11 million military died. Countless others died because of the ravages of war, famine, pestilence, etc. All of this was going on while the other statistics I just mentioned on the previous slide were also going on. Or how about this storm, World War II, right? 3% of the world population was wiped out out of 2.5 billion people. 3% was wiped out because of World War II. If you were alive between 1900 and 1947, you must have thought the end of the world was here. You saw atomic warfare introduced, melting the heavens. This is extraordinary. So we worry about COVID. COVID is nothing compared to what these folks went through. And they never complained about it. We had people turn against each other. There were 10,000 calls a day to complain about people not wearing masks during COVID. Neighbors calling on neighbors that were friends for years, they became enemies overnight. Why? Fear does horrible things. You want to overcome, you have to overcome fear first. <clears throat> How about this for a storm? People say, well, the Bible says that the earth won't be destroyed by nuclear power. Yes, but it'll be ravaged by it. What makes you think the enemy's not going to use nuclear? It won't wipe out all of humanity? Of course not. We know what the Bible says. But you better understand, you're not far away from this. Does the size of the storm matter? Or do we need to look at the Prince of Peace? Are we going to trust Scripture and what it says? Trust. It's all about trust and whether or not we will trust God with our lives, our families, our forgiveness, so that we may have peace and no fear. What does perfect love do, the Bible say? Casts out fear. Are we going to operate and be motivated either by fear or by faith? What's your choice? It's plain and simple. Notice what this quote is from Steps to Christ. Christ is the source of every right impulse. He is the only one that can implant in the heart enmity, which is hatred, against sin. Every desire for truth and purity, every conviction of our own sinfulness is an evidence that his spirit is moving upon our hearts. Further, the sinner may resist the love of Christ, may refuse to be drawn to Christ, but if they do not resist, they will be drawn to Jesus. 
a knowledge of the plan of salvation will lead them to the foot of the cross in repentance for their sins, which have caused the sufferings of God's dear Son. Steps to Christ, page 18. People don't write like this anymore. The Lord is asking you, you're going to focus, he says, focus on me, not the storm, right? Is he saying that to you? Is he saying that to you? Raise your hand if he's saying that to you. Can you focus on him? He gives you a mini version of that, doesn't he? In the Gospels, we learn, right, that he comes walking to the boat when the disciples were on the boat. He comes walking, and they thought he was some sort of ghost, right? Another time, he, they're in a storm, and he's sleeping. He's the creator. Before you can accept Christ as your Savior, you must first understand he is your creator. John chapter 1, 1 through 14 tells us. He's your judge. John 5, 22, he says, the Father judges no man, but has committed all judgment to the Son. He's also your advocate, your propitiation, your substitute, your lawyer. How do you lose that case in court? Yeah? Why would you have fear? When he was casting out the demons, he didn't have to scream. You want to know who's powerful? They can whisper it, and everybody does it. He whispered, come out, be at peace, and they fled. Why? Because he has to be careful what he says. He speaks, and the world comes into view, and the heavens are created. And yet we worry about fear. Why would you fear a defeated enemy? Why? So if, if the symptoms are fear, what is the condition? Let's take a look. What is God ready to do for all those that call upon him? Psalms, David gets heavy with this. Notice what David says, Psalms 86, 3 to 7. Be merciful unto me, O Lord, for I cry unto thee daily. Rejoice the soul of thy servant, for unto thee, O Lord, do I lift up my soul. For thou, Lord, art good, ready to forgive, and plenteous in mercy unto all them that call upon thee. Give ear, O Lord, unto my prayer, and attend to the voice of my supplication. Notice what he says next. In the day of my trouble, I will call upon thee, for thou will answer me. Amen? Can you have confidence? Is there reason to be afraid? Can the gospel message be shared? Everyone's life has been turned upside down in some way, shape, or form the past two years, a worldwide pandemic, economic collapse, political hatred. I don't understand the brethren getting involved with politics in this world. You need to focus on the politics of heaven. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, and the angels working to save you. The politicians on this earth are going to get you killed. They, they can't tell the truth about the weather. Natural disasters of epic proportion, perhaps nuclear attacks, terrorism, asteroid strikes. Don't forget about asteroid strikes. Weaponizing viruses and much more. Does the size of the storm matter? <clears throat> Did you know that the Bible commands us not to be afraid? There's a war on your senses, I'm telling you. There's an assault coming on your senses. natural or unnatural. The Lord himself talked about it, including false Christ, false prophets, and a fake second coming. So the enemy is going to use those things to deceive you, to bury you. And we need to have confidence in Scripture, confidence that you have the truth. It must be unshakable confidence and complete absence of fear. And this only comes with an in-depth study of Scripture and a personal relationship with Christ that is so deep and so complex that fear does not even come to mind. Yeah? Folks, am I telling you the truth? Am I putting you to sleep today? Raise your hand if I'm putting you to sleep. Is this something you need to hear? I need to hear it. No one's telling me. <clears throat> Why the need to master fear through faith in Christ? Why? You can only master it through Christ. Why? If we don't master fear, the enemy will use it to his advantage to wipe out any remnant of faith that you may have in Christ. He will bury you with it. 
So you must have an unshakable faith in Christ. The day is coming when no government welfare or personal efforts that you may make, try to make, will provide your needs. You won't be able to buy and sell. Only supernatural means will suffice. And by supernatural, I am talking about what is natural, what is above what's natural to you. I'm talking about a relationship with Christ. Amen? If he's the light, the truth, and the way, and he's the door, what other way is there? Is there another way? So we need to have peace in the storm. The number one reason that people will listen to you is if you have peace in the storm, no matter what stressors, no matter what craziness is coming. <clears throat> the Bible tells us in Daniel, in the book of Revelation, in Matthew chapter 24, 25, and Psalms 91, many things about the end times. It's called eschatology. So we have to talk about fear because there will be an assault on your senses as time gets worse. We have to look at it. And if we don't look at these things now, how will we deal with it when it does come? Things to make the whole world become super religious, to force a state religion on us to be enforced by a decree of death. This is what the Bible talks about in the eschatological verses, meaning the verses about the end times. <clears throat> Notice what the Lord himself says, Matthew 24, 21. For then shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, no, nor ever shall be. That's what's coming. Who, who understands what that means? Very few. It's going to be an assault on your senses. And what is your first inclination? Is it to be afraid or to be... To, to hide in his faith, hide under his wings, like Isaiah says, right? What is it going to be? If you don't look at fear today, I'm shocked at how many pastors are afraid to talk about fear. They're afraid to talk about fear. <clears throat> and they talk about, you're wonderful, I'm wonderful. No, we're not. We're, we're not wonderful. We're in danger, serious danger. We have to get real. Listen, there's 168 hours in a week. Some of you spend four to eight hours a day on the internet or watching TV. What's it to you? If I keep you an hour here in a sermon, what is it to you? Where do you got to go that's more important? You got nowhere to go. Because the number one goal is to overcome. You need to look these things in the face and get ready. Because a time is coming that will either destroy you or it will draw you closer. There's no in between. And yet pastors are not getting people ready. I don't know about your pastor, because I don't know him. I'm saying I've been to a lot of churches, and I hear fairy tales and nonsense and, and all sorts of craziness. And I, talk, I hear political correctness. We've got no time for earthly politics. You're not helping your community by getting involved in politics, unless it's the politics of heaven. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, and the angels working to save you. That's it. The rest. It's nonsense. The Bible calls it a dunghill. What's a dunghill? Do I need to tell you what a dunghill is? Filthiness is rags. This is disgusting. I see brethren in the Christian churches getting involved in earthly politics, socialism, or communism. Same thing. Religion is the opiate of the masses. That's their number one tenet, meaning no God. This is nonsense. Stay away from it. You want to help your community? Preach Christ crucified. Show me what Christ has done in your life to give you peace in a storm. Otherwise, I don't want to hear what you have to say. Forgive me. If you venture too far from the scripture, you've got nothing to say. I don't trust anything you say. You shouldn't trust me. If I venture from here, I have nothing to say. Right? Amen? <clears throat> Notice what Christ says about fear. Notice what he says. This is the answer to the question I asked you earlier. If fear is the symptom, what is the condition? Here's the answer. Mark 44, verse 40. He said unto them, why are you so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? You notice here that Christ equates being fearful with having no faith. So if the symptoms in your condition is fear, what is the diagnosis? No faith. How do we miss this? Nobody ever told me this. I never knew this. 
But the scriptures tell us how to gain confidence to overcome fear through our relationship with whom? The Lord. <clears throat> Notice what Isaiah writes. Isaiah doesn't mess around. He, he comes heavy too. Isaiah 51, 12. I, even I, this is the Lord talking, am he that comforted you. Who art thou that thou shouldst be afraid? Who are you to be afraid? Imagine the Lord asking you that. Uh, folks, is any of this my opinion or am I reading you scripture? Okay, so notice. You know, that thou should be afraid of a man that shall die or the son of man which shall be made as grass. Notice Isaiah 41, 13. For I, the Lord thy God, will hold thy right hand, saying unto thee, Fear not, I will help thee. Notice Isaiah 14, 3. And it shall come to pass in that day that the Lord shall give thee rest from thy sorrow and from thy fear and from the bondage wherein thou wast made to serve. He's talking about preparing you for the end times, preparing you to overcome. Amen? Don't you want to be with Christ forever? Isn't that your goal? It's the first and foremost. And if you align yourself with that goal, you'll know how to love your family better, love your wife, love your husband better, love your children better. Otherwise, you have no idea how to love. Apart from Christ, you don't know how to love. It's impossible. What are we talking about here? Notice Isaiah 54, 14. In righteousness shall thou be established. Thou shalt be far from oppression. Notice this, for thou shalt not fear, and from terror it shall not come thee. Can this build confidence in you and your relationship with God? Can these verses build confidence in you? Can I get someone to say amen, brother? Right? Raise your hands if you feel this can build confidence in you. Does the scriptures come alive? They need to come alive in us. If the scripture, these are words on a page, but if they don't come alive in you, what good are they? That's the gospel that's got to go around the world, where the whole world sees you standing, just like Shadrach, Meshach, and again, Bendigo. The ruler of the world at that time put them right front and center. Seventy years earlier, the Lord himself said, when you're in the furnace, I'll be with you. Seventy years later with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, he was standing in there, wasn't he? You all know the story, right? So he tells you, I'm going to be right with you. Who should you fear? <clears throat> How about this as a confidence builder? Proverbs 3, 24, 26. Solomon doesn't mess around either. When thou liest down, thou shalt not be afraid. Thou shalt not be afraid. Yea, thou shalt lie down, and thy sleep shall be sweet. Be not afraid of sudden fear, neither of the desolation of the wicked when it shall come. Notice this next statement. For the Lord shall be thy, what? Confidence, and shall keep thy foot from being taken. Proverbs 1, 33. But whoso hearkeneth unto me shall dwell safely, and shall be quiet from fear or evil. This is the Lord talking. You'll be quiet from fear or evil if you, what? Hearken unto me, the Lord says. You shall dwell safely. Amen? <clears throat> so Paul and Peter also come at you too. They're not messing around. 2 Timothy 1.7, For God hath not given us the spirit of fear. So where must that spirit of fear come from? If God doesn't give it to you, where did it come from? The enemy. But the power, notice what, what the Lord does give you. He gives you the spirit of power and of love and of a sound mind. Not an erratic, spastic you know, losing control mind like fear causes in most people. Hebrews 13, 6, so that we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper, and I will not, what? I will not, what? Fear what man shall do to me. This is how the martyrs went to be burned at the stake. This is why they were singing hymns, and they didn't show any fear, and thousands were converted simply by them singing and not fearing death. What are you prepared to do? What am I prepared to do? I can tell you with 100% certainty I've never talked to you folks about this. Have I? It's the first time, right? Probably not too much. But here's what I can tell you with 100% certainty on that flip side of that coin. None of you have talked to me about this. Yeah? <clears throat> Notice what Peter says. For the eyes of the Lord are over 
the righteous, and his ears are open unto their prayer, but the face of the Lord is against them that do evil. And who is he that will harm you? Who is he that will harm you? If you be followers of that which is good. Who's going to harm you if you're followers of that which is good? What is good? The only standard you know for good is here. When they said to Jesus, oh, good master, he said, call no man good except our Father in heaven. The Father sets the standard. He put his character in writing. And yet we don't read it enough. We watch television three hours a day. We're on the Internet six, seven hours a day. And then we come to church and we complain. Listen, if you have low blood sugar, I apologize for keeping you. If you don't have low blood sugar, I make no apologies to you. Okay? <clears throat> so, and who is he that will harm you if you be followers of that which is good? But, and if you suffer for righteousness' sake, happy are you, and be not afraid of their terror, neither be troubled. So Psalms 91, this is a famous verse. Four to six, he shall cover thee with his feathers, and under his wings shalt thou trust. His truth shall be thy shield and buckler. What is your shield and buckler? Paul talks about it. You want to read about putting on the whole armor of God? Ephesians chapter 6, 9 through 19, put on the whole armor of God. Notice this. His truth shall be thy shield and buckler. Thou shalt not be afraid. What? Do you, Wait, is that an order? Is that a commandment? Is it a commandment, right? Thou shalt, what? Not steal. Thou shalt not bear false witness. What? Thou shalt not be afraid. What are we talking about here? Man, people are afraid to talk about fear. Hmm. Thou shalt not be afraid for the terror by night, nor the arrow that flieth by day, nor the pestilence that walketh in darkness, nor for the destruction that wasteth at noonday. Jesus equates peace with not being afraid. Notice what he says in John 14, 27. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give unto you, not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. The famous Psalms 23, right? We all quote this one. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, what? I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod, thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointed my head with oil, my cup runneth over. Who exactly should I fear? Raise your hand if there's anyone I should fear. Should I fear? Perfect love casts out fear. But you can't love someone you don't know. That's why he's called a personal savior. Notice what Psalms, David says in Psalms 27, 1 to 3, The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? Though a host should encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war should rise against me, in this will I be what? confident is any of this my opinion my opinion doesn't matter what matters is that I present scriptures I did this PowerPoint because I can't cover enough ground unless I give you the the scriptures up here on the screen you can't turn fast enough for me to in your own Bibles what incredible confidence unless we can convey that we are not afraid and unless we can convey a calmness in the storm people will not want to study with you that's why your pews aren't full. It's wonderful that we travel to foreign lands to help people. It's wonderful to go on mission trips. Don't get me wrong. But we're ignoring our own backyard. This church should be filled, and yet we can't convey peace in the storm to people. It's very simple. Give out steps to Christ. That's peace in the storm. I'll tell you that. That little book is powerful. None of you are capable of writing like that. Neither am I. Because if you were, I'd be quoting you up here. We need to supernaturally overcome fear above the natural realm. Supernatural events can only occur with the help of supernatural beings. What am I talking about? Father, Son, Holy Spirit, and the angelic host. That's who's fighting for you. Are there any more powerful beings in the universe? Yeah, who's with me here? Are there any more powerful beings in the universe? 
No. That's it right there. That's the politics of heaven right there. God the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, and the angelic host. That's the politics you need to get involved with. And here's a crescendo, an apex moment in Scripture. You want to take it to the top? Notice this. Romans 8, 37 to 39. Nay, Paul says, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature. Basically, he's saying nothing can keep you. Right? Shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Is this a confidence builder? Can you be more confident? Raise your hand if you can be more confident when you read Scripture. Raise your hand. One, one person raise their hand. Can you, somebody raise their hand that they, you can get more confidence in Scripture? Amen. I, I, I must be putting you to sleep today. This is not very exciting, is it? Mm -mm. Wow. The grace and peace of Christ. Notice this quote. This is magnificent. Steps to Christ, page 19. I, got to, I was on page 18 earlier. Look at this quote. The same divine mind that is working upon the things of nature is also speaking to the hearts of men and creating an inexpressible craving for something they have not. The things of the world cannot satisfy their longing. The Spirit of God is pleading with them to seek for those things that alone can give peace and rest. The grace of Christ, the joy of holiness, through influences seen and unseen, our Savior is constantly at work to attract the minds of men from the unsatisfying pleasures of sin to the infinite blessings that may be theirs in Him. Is this powerful stuff? This church was raised up in 1844, especially for the last time. Do you have a confidence that you have the truth in Scripture? You have a unique message. Start acting unique. I need to start acting unique. I'm not here to criticize anybody. I'm pointing it at myself more than anybody. Trust me, I'm, I'm a lot harder on myself than I am on you. Can Scripture come alive in our lives? Romans 8, 32, notice what he says. Paul says, He that spared not his own son, but delivered him, talking about Christ, up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Including his Holy Spirit. Supernaturally overcome fear. What can the knowledge of our acceptance with God bring? Romans 5, 1, Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God, through our Lord Jesus Christ. Peace from fear, peace from anxiety, and peace from anger. What am I talking about here? Of what nature is the peace of the believer? Notice what Jesus himself tells us. John 14, 27, peace I leave with you. My peace I give unto you, not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. So if you have fear, do you really have faith? There are conditions of faith. There are levels of faith. Let me ask you a question. Does God love you unconditionally? He does. Does God accept you unconditionally? Are you sure? He spends the whole scriptures telling you that there are conditions to his accepting you. You can come as you are, yes, come through the door. But then, to be his, to be the sheep, to follow the shepherd, there are conditions. You accept him as Lord and Savior. Do you know what Lord means? You're accepting him as ruler. Lordship is rulership over you. And the ruler has rules. There are conditions to your acceptance. He loves you unconditionally. What makes you, he talks about conditions in here to acceptance towards the final stages. As long as you're breathing and the final things haven't occurred yet, you still have a chance. But at some point, you have to either perfectly have faith in him and trust him implicitly, or you're going to operate perfectly off of fear. Which is it going to be? Second Corinthians 5.17, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. You're a new creature in Christ. And so, 
Will those who have this peace be free from tough times, heartache, or tribulation? Notice what Jesus says. These things, John 16, 33, these things have I, I have spoken unto you, that in me you might have peace. In the world you shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer, which is the opposite of fear. I have overcome the world. Amen? We're almost done, folks. What blessed experience may we have? Notice Revelation 3.20. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any mere hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me. Jesus is talking here. Philippians 4.7. And the peace of God which passes all understanding. That's what people want to know right there. They want to know the peace that passes understanding. Shall keep your hearts and mind through Christ Jesus. Remember the verses about men's hearts failing them. Can we be inspired by what we read? This is the final Bible verse right here. Ephesians 2, 4 to 7. Paul says, But God, who is rich in mercy for his great love wherein he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ. By grace you are saved, and hath raised us up together, and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness towards us through Christ Jesus. So the question is, are we going to be cynical? What, what posture do you take to look at the world? Do you take George Bernard Shaw's posture? Notice what he says. Are we radiating cynicism or criticism? Notice what he says. When commenting on the turmoil and disorder of the world, if the other planets are inhabited, they must be using the Earth as their insane asylum. Do you have that attitude? Or do you have this man's attitude? What's it going to be? Are you radiating cynicism? Is everything a joke to me, to you? Are we taking things seriously? This is as serious as it gets right here. We're coming down to the end time. The Bible says it. What's it going to be? Are we going to take this posture? Notice this. And this is the last quote I'll give you on this. Steps of Christ, page 33. What we do not overcome will overcome us and work out our destruction. So I want to ask you one more time, one last time. Should we focus on the Lord and not on the storm? What's it going to take? This is a church family. I see a beautiful church family in front of me. What are you prepared to do? I asked you a question last time I was here. How many folks feel that they've been enriched today? You have more information than, than you came in with. Raise your hand if you feel like you know more than you came in with. Okay. There's a flip side to that coin. Now you're held to a higher standard of accountability. Amen? You should want to be. I'm held to a higher standard of accountability. It's very simple. This is not about fear. It's really about overcoming. Fear is just an emotion that paralyzes us. Neurologically, it can take hold of us and wipe us out. We can become traitors to the Lord. Do you know in the Plain of Dora, you know the story of the, the furnace, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? There were 400,000 people in the plain, 10,000 of which, estimated, were sp supposedly God's people, and they all bowed down. Only three out of 400,000 stood for the Lord. And the Lord appeared right with them. Read the story in Daniel chapter 3. It's remarkable. And in Isaiah, 70 years earlier, he promised that that's what he would do. And in front of the whole world watching, the economic and governmental power and religious power of the world at that time, the first great empire, Babylon, that's where the Lord stood in the fiery furnace with them. You don't think he can stand with you? The Lord's saying, focus on me, not the storm. I hope this made a difference for you. I wonder if we can pray together. Lord, bless this church family, Lord. They have a mighty work to do in the community and in other places, Lord. Help us to be unified in our efforts. There's no more time, Lord. We're losing time. Help us to focus on you. Sharpen our minds. Quicken our intellect, Lord. Give us the courage. 
Help us to listen to your words and not be afraid. Help us to constantly look at you. Where our shepherd is going, there is where we should go. What our shepherd says to do, that we should do. Please, Father, give us the strength. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. We also want to thank God for um, his word spoken to us this morning. To finish the service, let us stand and sing the number, the words of the number 522. My hope is built on nothing less. Thank you. 